The next installment of uh, our Kingdom teaching series is here. Um, we're going to be in Luke 17 today. I was looking at the Lucan references to the Kingdom of God. I skipped over a couple that I felt like were probably duplicate teachings and references from Matthew and Mark. Um, some would probably argue they're somewhat unique today. In Luke 17, there's actually a whole section talking directly about the Kingdom of God. And I think some might say that this is actually a duplicate reference. It's very similar to a passage that's in Matthew, and yet it's also significantly different. And I think it's different enough on the whole that it causes us to hear this teaching differently. I think we receive it differently than we did when we heard it in, say, the Gospel of Matthew. So I think what I want to do today, I don't know if uh, there's, I think there's plenty to think about. I don't know how long the conversation will be. It may be relatively short, but I think the point here um, is is super good. And today might be, man, this series has been um, at times like uh, rough to endure because it's been like, it's it's provoking. It It's challenging. It challenges a lot of the things that, well, at least for me, I find this teaching series like the kingdom is not easy and the kingdom of God is not what I expect it to be and the kingdom of God isn't what I want it to be half the time and at least not in my human urges. And so I, it's just been hard to process a lot of that and it feels very much like there's plenty of things for me to be confronted by. Today's uh, conversation may be a little bit more abstract, might give us a little bit of a break maybe might be more helpful than um, necessarily feel like a rebuke at all. Uh, but yeah, it's it's going to be, a, a, I think, a good conversation. So what I want to do is I want to read through um, the whole section and then kind of go back through and walk through it. And I think there'll be just a, maybe, I hope, a really helpful point here when we think about the kingdom of God. So I'm in, I'm in Luke chapter 17, and I'm going to be starting in verse 20 and reading through uh, the rest of the chapter. Yes, we're going to read through the rest of the chapter. Uh, chap uh, chapter 17, verse 20. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. So here's that reference to the kingdom of God. He's being asked by the Pharisees, when's the kingdom of God going to show up? Jesus replied, the kingdom, uh, the coming of the kingdom of God is not concerning, excuse me, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you there he is or here he is. Do not go running off after them, for the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day of the Son of Man uh, is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you that on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord, they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. So here's this teaching um, prompted by a question from the Pharisees about when the kingdom of God would come. Now, we, we read a very similar passage and encountered a very similar teaching in Matthew. And I believe we talked about it in this kingdom series. Um, we definitely talked about it in the podcast. And I believe we referenced it when we went through uh, Matthew, and I believe I linked all of those podcast episodes where you could go. And that teaching, a lot of people loved it, uh, responded really well to it. Um, th there is very much a, a Christian idea that pushes back against... The, I, I said I didn't think that teaching was about like the second coming or the, the end days or 
something in the future. I thought Jesus was talking about things like the destruction of Jerusalem, things that are, that are imminent, the world that they live in, this three-part eschatology. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God being present in the kingdom of the world. And a lot of people in the Matthew passage are like, okay, but very clearly at the end, he's not talking, he's talking about the second coming, he's talking about the end times. Um, and, and they're like, it, it's, it becomes clear. And I, I just, I don't see it that way. And one of the things that I, uh, I kind of go to, to make my case is that in Luke's version of the story, it's far more clear to me that Jesus is having a, a, a discussion about the here and the now, the immediate future, the world that they're living in, in that moment. I don't think he's talking about, um, and some people will still make the argument in this last paragraph, um, when it talks about the coming of the son of man, the appearing of the son of man, some people are, are going to make the leap from present realities to end times. But I, in my, in my mind and in my opinion, this passage makes it far more clear what Jesus is getting at. So let's walk through the passage, if we will, and see what we can do with this. Right? So once, on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, so the Pharisees want to know, when is the kingdom of God going to show up? So the Pharisees, in this story, the Pharisees that are asking this question, have this presumption. Well, can we presume this? Let me, let me read that again. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, I feel like, I would probably have to look at the Greek, I feel like that question presumes that the kingdom of God is not here. They're expecting the kingdom of God to be coming still. Like it has not come. When is it going to come? It's possible that they're asking Jesus to weigh in on and wade into the conversation about two-part and three-part Jewish eschatology and the kingdom of God and how it interacts with this age. What about this age? What about the age to come? Where are we at? It's possible they're asking that question. It does not sound that way or appear that way. It sounds like they're saying, when is the kingdom of God going to show up? To which Jesus responds, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. So let's work backwards. The kingdom of God is in your midst. So Jesus says, if you're asking me about when it's going to come, too late, it's already here. Like the kingdom of God is already here. And Jesus seems to say, part of your problem when you ask this question is you're trying to make the kingdom of God like, like a... a a, a, a place or a, a physical experience or a state of being that is like fixed in your world. You're trying to make it a, uh, like an imperial reality. Like you, you want a socio-political experience or you want uh, a nation with borders or you want like, you're looking for the kingdom of God as a thing where you're going to be able to say, he literally says, here it is, or there, that's the kingdom of God. But Jesus says, but that's not how the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God's not coming like that. The kingdom of God is already here, and the kingdom of God is in your midst. That There's nowhere where the kingdom of God is not bursting forth, and there's nowhere where the kingdom of God is completely, purely present with nothing, with no weeds sown in the wheat, if you go back to the beginning of our teaching series. Of course, there are weeds and wheat in the, like, the kingdom of God is everywhere, and no, it's the, it's the here and not yet. A lot, of, a lot of teachers and theologians will talk about the here but not yet nature to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is not yet experienced in its fullness. And that, that seems to fit the teaching and theology of Jesus. The kingdom of God's, you're, you're looking for the, like, when is the kingdom of God going to come? But the kingdom of God's already here. It's here. And it's all around you. And you have to be diligent. Think of all the things we've heard throughout this teaching series. You have to be diligent to live in it, to enter it, to experience it, to participate with it. Like the kingdom of God is, all, like there's nowhere where the kingdom of God, is, you're looking for the kingdom of God to show up somewhere so you can go to it. But the kingdom of God is already accessible to you now. Do you want it? Then he said to his disciples, so at first the Pharisees ask a question, and he answers the question. They want to know, like, when's the kingdom of God going to come? And Jesus is like, too late, it's already here. It's accessible. It's not, the kingdom of God doesn't work like that. 
The kingdom of God is accessible to you. It's in your midst. Whenever you want to, you can access the kingdom of God. You can enter and participate and you can live in the kingdom of God right now, anytime you want to. Just live in harmony with the intention and the will of God. Then he turns to his disciples. So now I'm more focused. And, and who knows if he does this while the Pharisees can still hear him? It doesn't tell us one way or another. Maybe the Pharisees are still listening in. But he, then he said to his disciples, a time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Like Jesus says, there is this urge. There's this urge in us to want to look for the kingdom of God in some other way, in some other place, coming in some other state. And so you're going to long to see, you're going to long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. You're going to, you're, I want to see some... People will say, there it is, or here it is, because there's this longing in us to want something else. Do not go running off after them. Do not go running off after them. So every time something happens, every time there's a bunch of natural disasters, and everybody jumps on Facebook, or the COVID vaccine, or, or pandemics, or whatever it is, and everybody goes, this is the end times, and here's all the reasons why, and here's a... Jesus is like, nope. Nope, that's not, that's not how the kingdom of God works. It's not how the kingdom of God is going to work. The kingdom of God is everything, everything that's going to happen in the world, as far as the kingdom of God showing, is already here. The kingdom of God is already as accessible as it could possibly be to you. Now, there's a co-mingling. There's a coexistence of a world of brokenness and a world of shalom. There's weeds and there's wheat growing together. But the kingdom of God is already here. Quit looking for some like other thing in the future because everything you need to be concerned about is right now. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. At which who knows what he means by that. Does he mean like the kingdom of God will be obvious, like everybody will be able to see it? It lights up like it's not like you're going to have to be looking in one spot because if you... Because if you, because if you, if you're not looking in the right spot, you might miss it. Like, have you ever been around when lightning happens and you know, like, even if you're not looking at the lightning, you're like, oh, oh, I, I know lightning just struck because it lit up the whole sky. Is that Jesus's point? That you don't have to be looking or you're going to miss it? Or is Jesus's point that the kingdom of God, like, boom, shows up out of nowhere. It, it has an impact and it's just gone. And that's, I, it's hard for me to know exactly what his point is here. Maybe it's both. Maybe it's something else entirely. But first, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, just as it was in the days of Noah. Now listen to Jesus' point here. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. What is Jesus' point here? Jesus' point is nobody in the days of Noah sat back and went, here comes the flood. He, here, comes, here comes the kingdom of God. Everybody was just going about their business and the kingdom of God showed up. The kingdom of God was, didn't come like with some announcement, some set of signs. Pharisees, you're trying to, you're trying to, you're trying to ask the wrong question, answer the wrong question, when in fact, the truth of the matter is the kingdom of God is in your midst. But you, you, you're looking for something else. But that's not how it works. It's not how it worked in the day of Noah, in the days of Noah. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day that Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Again, same thing. It will be just like this on the day of the Son of Man is revealed. On that day... No one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and another left. Obviously, people hear this paragraph and they immediately think of the rapture. But that's not what this is referring to. And that's not how this works. In, in the days of Noah, who was taken? The wicked. The wicked were taken away. And who was left? Noah and his family. So the wicked are taken away. The wicked are destroyed. And the righteous are left. 
In Lot, in the story of Lot, who's taken away? Who's destroyed? The wicked, who's left? Lot and his family, right? So when, when you have two people walking in a field and one is taken, you want to be the one left. <laughs> I had a Bible college professor um, that said, you want to be left behind. Uh, that is exactly what you want. You want to be left behind, according to good Jewish biblical theology. Um, because that's, that's what God does. He sweeps away the wicked. He blows them away like chaff. What remains? The grain. Always, always. Uh, the fish are caught in a net, and you keep the good ones, and you throw away the bad ones. What's left is always the good stuff, right? But that's beside the point. At the very least, one of the things we can say about Jesus's point here, at the very least, let's, let's talk about what we can say for sure, rather than what's maybe more debatable. What we can say for sure is that Jesus' point about the kingdom in this story is that the kingdom of God is not something you're supposed to be like waiting for, looking for signs for, trying to figure out how the coming of the kingdom of God works. Jesus is like, no, it doesn't work like that. It's not how it works. He tells the Pharisees you're asking the wrong question because the kingdom of God is already in your midst. He then goes on to make a bunch of points that says, you can't see this coming. You didn't see it coming in the days of Noah. You don't see it coming in the days of, of Lot. You're not going to see it coming in the days of the Son of Man or the destruction of Jerusalem. You don't see this, this stuff coming. So what are you supposed to do? What's the calling then? If you don't see it coming, what, did, what were you supposed to do in the, day, in the days of Noah? Live righteously. What were you supposed to do in the days of Lot? Live righteously. What are you supposed to do? Uh, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. What are you supposed to do? Look for all the signs and figure out how to, you know, interpret the... The newspapers and no, live righteously. The days of the Son of Man are coming. What are you supposed to do? Live righteously. Why? Because the kingdom of God is already in your midst. You're not waiting for something else. We're not waiting for some future date when this life is over, where we can all fly away. We're, everything that we need is already present. Everything we need is already here. The kingdom is already in your midst. And again, I think his disciples say, where, Lord? He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. What does that mean? Well, A, I think a lot of people would argue that's a remez. That's going to be a callback to the prophets. So we're going to have to do some Pardes work there to see what you think Jesus' drosh and what his meaning might be. But nevertheless, I think his point runs completely consistently with everything else he said. Well, once, once you have dead bodies, then... You will not have a sign telling you that it's coming on the front end. The only signs will be after it's all happened. You won't see the vultures gather until the bodies are already dead. So what do we do, Lord? Live righteously. Enter the kingdom now. Be a part of it today. Participate in it now. Because that's the only thing to do with the kingdom of God. You're not waiting for something else. You're not trying to figure out the future. Just live in the kingdom now. It's already in your midst. And I don't know how many of my listeners and viewers on YouTube or I don't know how many of us, like if you've, if you've been following the podcast for a while, you probably already know this. This probably isn't like a crazy, um, you know, rocket science idea theologically. But there's there's probably still a lot of people that easily get wound up about um, some of this fanatical Christian, the way that we kind of spin up current events and the way that we talk about the end times. And this lesson becomes a really important reminder. Don't get worked up about, <laughs> don't get worked up about current events. And that's not to make current events trivial. Like pandemics are horrible. Um, people died by the hundreds of thousands. Um, wars are terrible. Earthquakes, natural disasters, these things are horrible. Uh, we're not trivializing those things. We're just saying don't let those things get you wound up looking for something that's already here. It's already here. Don't try to interpret the times. Live in the now. And that will be enough. Um, yeah, and a little, bit, a little bit easier lesson to hear today. A little bit more abstract, a little bit safer. Doesn't, doesn't quite sting as much, I would imagine, for most of us, but important. Important for us to be reminded today 
This isn't some academic exercise. There, there's plenty. The kingdom of God is here. It's already here. The kingdom of God. What can I learn about the kingdom of God? Again, a reminder that it's in your midst. It's now. It's present. It's something to live into today. What am I called to do? What might happen in the future? Where is this all going? What about, what about the socio-political situation? What about wars and Russia and Ukraine? And what about nuclear potential? And and what about what about what about climate change? And what about what about all of these things? And and some of these things are super important. Like some of these things matter, and we need to do things about these things. But what do I do about this theologically? Live righteously. Don't give up on scandalous forgiveness. Love your neighbor. Take care of the poor. Do, do those things. Pursue justice. Remember that the foundation of God's throne is, is righteousness and justice. And live in a kingdom founded on those same principles. Because it's already here. And it's already in your midst. No matter what is going on around you or what the news says or what it looks like outside your window, the kingdom of God is already here. So what do I do? What do I do? Live righteously. When will it come? Too late. Too late. It's already here. All right. Uh, we'll see where Luke takes us next, maybe in a couple weeks here. Um, and we'll just keep on moving through the kingdom of God references in the gospel of Luke. Talk to you then.